Hello and welcome. This is lesson number two, and today we're going to have an introduction to the PCI DSS. Most of the information provided here is taken directly from the current version of the DSS. At the end of the lesson, I'll show you the PCI DSS, so if you're interested in reading more about it, I'm going to leave you a link to the PCI Security Standards Council where you can download the different versions of the DSS and a lot of additional resources. So let's begin. The Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, PCI DSS, was developed to enhance cardholder data security and facilitate the adoption of consistent data security measures globally. The DSS provides a baseline of technical and operational requirements designed to protect account data. PCI DSS applies to all entities involved in payment card processing, including merchants, processors, acquirers, issuers, and service providers. The DSS also applies to all other entities that store, process, transmit cardholder data, sensitive authentication data, or SAD, or somehow could impact the security of the cardholder data environment or CDE. While specifically designed to focus on environments with payment card data, PCI DSS can also be used to protect against threats and secure other elements in the payment ecosystem. Once you start to go through the requirements, you'll realize that the rigor of the DSS is a good baseline from a security perspective. Some organizations that outsource their cardholder data environment, CTE, or payment operations to third parties are responsible for ensuring that the account data is protected by the third party. It is important to keep this in mind because the fact that the payment operations are being outsourced, it doesn't necessarily mean that the entity is not accountable for the security of the data. Key point to remember. And we already mentioned a couple of times account data and some other terms. Let's review those real quick. I want to make sure that we all are in the same page. You probably remember these from one of our first videos, the glossary. Account data comprised of cardholder data and sensitive authentication data. Cardholder data, remember, might be um, the PIN, primary account number, cardholder name, expiration date, service code. On the other hand, sensitive authentication data or SAD might be full track data, which is uh, could be the magnetic stripe data or equivalent on a chip, uh, CPP codes, values, pin blocks, pins. I hope those terms are clear at this point uh, because from here we'll start using the abbreviations more often. PCI DSS comprises a minimum set of requirements for protecting account data and may be enhanced by additional controls and practices to mitigate risk. Something very important to know is that the PCI DSS does not supersede local or regional laws, government regulations, or other legal requirements. This is very important to remember. I'm going to say that one more time. PCI DSS does not supersede local or regional laws, government regulations, or other legal requirements. Okay, now time to talk about the requirements. This is going to be a high level overview of the 12 PCI DSS requirements. First, there are six main domains or milestones, and within those six domains, there are 12 requirements. Now, each requirement has a number of sub-requirements, and that's uh, the structure of the PCI DSS. So let's review it at a high level. First, the current version, 3.2.1, and then uh, version 4. Domain 1, build and maintain a secure network and systems. Within Domain 1, we have requirement 1, which is install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. Requirement two, also within um, domain one, do not use vendor supply defaults or system password and other security parameters. 
Domain 2, protect cardholder data. Between Domain 2, we have Requirement 3, protect store cardholder data, and Requirement 4, encrypt transmission of cardholder data across open public networks. Domain 3, maintain a vulnerability management program. Within Domain 3, we have Requirement 5, protect all systems against malware and regularly update antivirus software or programs. Also Requirement 6, develop and maintain a secure systems and applications. Domain 4, implement strong access control measures. Within Domain 4, we have Requirement 7, restrict access to cardholder data by business need to know. Requirement 8, identify and authenticate access to system components. Requirement 9, restrict physical access to cardholder data. Now Domain 5, regularly monitor and test networks. Within Domain 5, we have Requirement 10, track and monitor all access to network resources and cardholder data. Requirement 11, regularly test security systems and processes. Finally, Domain 6, maintain an information security policy. And within Domain 6, we have Requirement 12, maintain a policy that addresses information security for all personnel. And that was a high overview of the requirements for uh, the TSS version 3.2.1. Now let's look at version 4. Domain 1, build and maintain secure networking systems. Requirement 1 and 2. Requirement 1, install and maintain network security controls. Requirement 2, apply secure configurations to all system components. Little different. Domain 2, protect account data. Requirement 3, within this domain, protect store account data and requirement phone, uh, 4, sorry, protect cardholder data with strong cryptography during transmission over open public networks. Domain 3, maintain a vulnerability management program. Within this domain, requirement 5, protect all systems and networks from malicious software. Requirement 6, develop and maintain secure systems and software. Now, next domain, Requirement 4, implement strong access control measures. Requirement 7, within uh, this domain, restrict access to system components and cardholder data by business need to know. Exactly the same. Requirement 8, identify users and authenticate access to system components. And requirement nine, restrict physical access to cardholder data. Domain five, regularly monitor and test networks. Within this domain, we have requirement 10, lock and monitor all access to system components and cardholder data. And requirement 11, test security of systems and networks regularly. Finally, Domain 6, maintain an information security policy. And within this domain, we have Requirement 12, support information security with organizational policies and programs. As you can already tell, the name of some of the requirements is slightly different. However, the intent is very similar, almost the same. That's why it's so important for us to review version 3.2.1 before jumping to version 4. Because as, as I said in a previous video, version 4 is a continuation, not a completely new standard. Okay, so let's keep going. As assessors or consultants, we use the standard as part of an entity's validation process. We want to verify and test, where applicable, all of the requirements to make sure that the entity being assessed meets the requirements for PCI compliance. This table is provided in the PCI DSS and I want to review it so you can start to have an idea on what the storage requirements are regarding cardholder data and sensitive authentication data. 
As we already uh, talked before, account data comprised of cardholder data and sensitive authentication data. So let's begin with PAN, or primary account number. Can we store the PAN? Yes. Do we need to render PAN unreadable? Yes. Can we store cardholder name? Yes. Do we need to render cardholder name unreadable? No. Can we store service code? Yes. Do we need to render uh, the service code unreadable? No. Can we store the expiration date? Yes, we can do that. Do we need to render it unreadable? No. On the other hand, sensitive authentication data, which we already um, talked about, full track data, CVBs codes, values, CAB, PIN, PINs block, we cannot store sensitive authentication data. Remember it. But, and I know, I have told you a couple of times already that sensitive authentication data cannot be stored after authorization, but there is one exception to that rule. So listen carefully. Issuers or entities providing issuance services can store sensitive authentication data after authorization if there is a legitimate business justification. Write this down and memorize it because it is very important. I'm going to say that one more time. Issuers or entities providing issuance services can store sensitive authentication data SAD, after authorization if there is a legitimate business justification. Important to remember. All right. As a summary, PCI DSS applies to all entities involved in payment card processing including merchants, processors, acquirers, issuers, and service providers. And also applies to all other entities that store, process, transmit cardholder data, sensitive authentication data, or somehow could impact the security of the CTE. Now, this last statement, could impact the security of the CTE, was included in the new version, version 4. You're not going to see this in version 3, that 2, that 1. Maybe you do, uh, but in the I think it's in the scoping guidance. And as I promised at the beginning of this uh, lesson, let's have a look at the PCI DSS. And here it is, PCI DSS version 3.2.1 was released May 2018. I recommend you to look at this document and especially these first pages, there is a lot of interesting, uh, uh, interesting information here some guidance, additional resources, as you can see here, that you might need or not necessarily need, but will be of a lot of help for you. And this is, this is it. It's a very extensive document. I'm going through the different requirements. Version 3.2.1 of the PCI DSS. Version 4 is way more extensive. Um, if you're a consultant or an assessor, you might be concerned. PCI DSS version 4 released March 2022. Same structure than version 3.2.1. As I said before, it's a continuation, not a completely new standard. Uh, kind of the same structure as well um, in the first pages some guidance on a lot of different things that you can do and how to work with the DSS. So I'm going to leave the link here to the PCI Security Standards Council where you can download all of these uh, versions. And I really and highly recommend you to go and read the standards, both version 3.2.1 and version 4. And that was a very quick review just having a look at the documents, we'll dive in more details in the next lessons. All right, and we have been talking about PCI DSS, all of the different entities that need to be compliant with uh, the DSS. There is something additional that I want to talk to you before ending this lesson. What would you do as an assessor if an entity is not PCI DSS compliant? We already discussed what PCI DSS is, entities that applies to, and so on. But how about when a merchant that stores, processes, and transmits cardholder data fails to be compliant with uh, PCI? I want you to think about that for a second. Let's review the statement one more time. 
A merchant that stores, processes, and transmits cardholder data fails to be compliant with PCI. Any ideas? Well, in this particular case, a couple of things could happen. First, depending on who the acquirer of the merchant is, there might be financial fines. Might be the case that the merchant gets an extension on the period of time required to prove compliance. Or the merchant could not be allowed to receive payments with cards anymore. And probably a merchant that is not allowed to receive cards anymore might end up facing a serious financial loss. All right, if you can think of anything else for a merchant and that is not compliant with PCI, please let me know. But as of right now, you made it. You made it till the end of this lesson. See you in the next one.